How's everybody doing? Yeah. Everybody over here? Everybody good? Good over here? Good. Excellent, man. We're so excited uh, to open up that room. We're actually not done. We're going to be able to put down a few more seats, which looks like a good thing because uh, we've kind of packed it out once again. So we're very excited to see uh, this thing continuing to grow and you guys continuing to, uh, to go out there, to be that movement, to bring people with you. Last week, we started a new series called Move, and we talked about calling uh, this, this belief that we have here at City West that every person was uniquely created with a unique purpose by God to go out and to affect change in our world. And that you all have incredible potential, and I know you may not all believe that at this moment, but that's why we're going to keep coming here and, and meeting together so that we can see how God wants to use us. Over the next two weeks, we're going to be talking about the church and so right up front, I, I want to ask us to all do something before we really engage in the conversation today. I, I want to ask you to take all of your ideas about the church, all of your preconceived notions, your traditions, the things that you loved growing up in church, the, the church of your childhood, going in your favorite Sunday school teacher, and the things that your grandparents thought about church, the things you hate about church, and the ways that it has hurt you, and that it's come against you, and the reason you have trouble even going to church now that you're an adult, Whatever those ideas are that you have in your mind about the church, I, I want us to put all of them on the table. I want everything to go on the table today and to us to get into scripture, get into the Bible to see what the actual intent of the church is. And so what I'm really asking to summarize is I'm asking if you guys will join me in the next two weeks to prioritize Jesus' original intent for the church above everything else, above our traditions, above our ideas, above our experiences. Are you okay prioritizing the original intent of Jesus above all else? Not, nod your head so I can keep going. Okay. I shared last week that I ended up hospitalized around this time last year, and I was in the hospital a long time, a total of about 14 days. It was a really meaningful time for me. Uh, this is the first time I felt God drawing me to come out here to City West. And with that calling, he gave me a word that really affirmed this calling, and it was the word movement. And a lot of my thoughts, not just in this recent season of my life, but over like the past four or five years, have really crystallized around this word movement. And as I began to wrestle with this idea and wrestle with my perspective on some things, this question kept coming to my mind, and I couldn't ignore it. And so finally I decided to just go after it and kind of wrestle it to the ground. It, it struck me as a weird question as a pastor for me to keep asking myself, but here it is. The question is, why would anyone go to church? It just kept coming to mind, coming to mind. Why would anyone go to church? A few weeks ago, my oldest son, Lane, who by the way is turning 13, today it's his birthday, so happy birthday, Lane. I promised him we wouldn't sing, so that's one of my presents to you, we will not sing happy birthday to you. Uh, Lane came home, and, he, you know, I always ask him what was going on at school and, you know, what they learned. And he was like, dude, we watched a video about how hot dogs are made. I will never eat a hot dog again. <laughs> See, something happens when we kind of draw back the curtain on things, when we get to peek behind the curtain and not just see what something is, but actually see how it was made. When you get a chance to look behind the curtain on certain things, they can kind of lose their magic. And I remember when that happened to me with the church. When I was 17, not only did I start working at uh, my local church in small town, Lampasas, Texas, but my worship band started traveling and playing for all kinds of different churches, and I got to see behind the scenes. I got to draw back the curtain and, and see that behind Sunday mornings, where there's inspiring services and smiling people, that there are six work days of politics and infighting, and not all the time, but most of the time, I saw decisions getting made based on the wants the wants of the biggest givers, not on the needs of the poor and oppressed and unchurched in their communities. And it was really disappointing for me. It really hurt. And it didn't take long for this to hit me personally as a staff member at a church. My senior year of high school, uh, my best friend, one of my, my very best friends, closest friends, uh, 
was a guy named Melvin. Melvin was one of the only black kids in this small rural town. And one night, Melvin was getting a ride back home from youth group when the car got pulled over. And this girl who was giving him a ride, uh, the car got searched, and they found a dime bag of weed. And so without asking any questions, my friend Melvin was arrested and taken to jail, and without even a warning or citation, the girl was told to go home. The problem is, it wasn't his weed. And so this huge scenario happened and, and all of this drama where without ever you know, going to court or being able to, to plead his own innocence, the very next day in our small town with nothing that ever happens exciting, he made the front page of the paper, name and picture. And, and you know, Melvin came from a family with a single mom and they didn't have a lot of money, they didn't have any vehicles and so I was his ride. I picked him up almost everywhere he went. We spent all of our time together. A lot of times he would even sleep at my house because we were already together, he might as well come over. And this is what happened to me that same week. Some of the church people and some of the church staff called me into a meeting to let me know that as a staff member, I represent the church and it wouldn't look too good to the community to see a staff member of the church with the guy from the paper. And I know we haven't known each other long. I've only been teaching out here for a few weeks. Um, I have some spiritual gifts, but patience is not always one of them. <laughs> and so I let these dudes know exactly what I thought. I thought, you, you know what? If people in the community see me standing behind someone who's disenfranchised and marginalized in our society, not giving up on him just when it seems like things are bad, then maybe people in the community would actually want to come to this church. That church wasn't super sad about me leaving. Anyway, (laughs) the sad part is, you know, those experiences that I had are really kind of a blip on the radar uh, of some of these big church controversies that seem like they're cycling through the media all the time and they're getting shared all around Facebook and our different social media accounts and we find out that high-level pastors who have spent their careers casting judgment on people as if they have no skeletons in their closet are actually involved in a sex scandal or embezzling money or they have all these other problems that they're going through. We see prominent pastors get up on stage and tell their congregation that God is telling them they need to buy him a 60 million dollar jet and it it, it all adds up and it builds on top of each other and the church's reputation has been so tarnished that it makes me wonder why would anyone go to church and so let's get really practical because maybe you love your church maybe you come out here to city west and you love coming even on a practical level just to make it those of you with little kids it's a miracle that you're here you've got to wake everyone up and you've got to get everyone fed and someone at least decently dressed to make it out the door and then someone makes you late and so you show up 10 minutes into the service and everyone is already singing and you feel like everyone's judging you even though no one really cares because they were late too and then by the time you finally make it to your seat you're like wishing that the bar was open because you need a drink <laughs> So why would anyone go to church? Oh man, it's so stressful, such a bad reputation. And so here's the sad reality. The reality is if if you look at the numbers, uh, people at large are deciding they're not going to go to church. 59% of millennials, millennials are the largest generation now, 59% who grew up in church, they have the foundation, they have the tradition, 59% have left the church and only time will tell if they'll ever come back. 85% of churches in America are actively declining. More than eight out of 10 churches are actively declining and every year countless churches are permanently closing their doors. The state of the church is not great right now. And this can be confusing to those of us uh, who work in churches. This can be confusing to those of us who are pastors because like knowing the Bible is our thing. That's like our main part of our job. And so if you're a pastor and you're watching your church in active decline, it's confusing because the first thing, the first thing that Jesus ever said about the church, it's recorded in Matthew's historical account of Jesus's life. This is what Jesus said. He said, I will build my church I will build my church and the forces of Hades, the power of hell itself, will not overpower it. And it's awesome and it's motivating, but it's confusing because if you're in a church that is slowly dying, it doesn't seem to go together. There's a contradiction there. I'm in a church. And Jesus said that the power of hell itself cannot come against it. But we look and more than eight out of 10 churches 
are slowly going towards closing their doors. If nothing is supposed to overcome the church, then why does it seem like the church is increasingly losing its power in our society? Why does it seem like the church is no longer influencing culture at all? Why does it feel like we have churches that have traded in the good news of Jesus to create these exclusive clubs with all these unwritten rules to try to keep all the people that they deem unnecessary outside of their walls? This is why we're doing this series. It's why we got to get this right. This is why we have to take all our traditions and all our ideas about church and put it on the table and prioritize Jesus's original intent because the thing that Jesus was talking about, he has said, and it is true, that nothing, nothing, nothing will overpower it. And so for the last several years, I've wrestled with this. Why would anyone go to church? And really, I've kind of come to the conclusion of two core issues in the matter. And this week, we're going to talk about the first, and next week, we'll follow up. But the first problem, the first place that we kind of got off track from Jesus' original intention has to do with a word, one singular word that has become incredibly divisive, uh, that, that has kept countless people from even considering Christianity, a word with so much baggage. And so today we are going to take some time and actually look at the word church. The word church. To really understand Jesus' intent for this thing that we're doing, this thing that we're a part of, we have to get clear on the word church. Now, an important starting place uh, when, when we look at this word and we try to put it in its proper context is to recognize, or for some of you to remember, that the Bible was not written in English. In fact, uh, English is a modern language, and even among the modern language, it's one of the youngest languages. The New Testament of the Bible that we're going to look at today was written in Greek. And over the years, incredible translators and interpreters have come together and they've translated the Bible into all kinds of languages, including the English language, so that you and I can have access to God's word, God's words to us, his instructions for our life. And so what I don't want to happen in this talk today is for you to lose any confidence in your English versions of the Bible. You don't have to go become a Greek scholar to hear from God out of his word. And it's important because at City West, we're going to be a people that gets intentional about spending time in our Bible. It's the primary way that God communicates to us and brings clarity to our lives. But while saying that, we also have to put the church in its proper context to understand the state of the church today. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at the etymology of the word church. Etymology just means how it became a word. Now, I've said translation, interpretation, and etymology. Some of you are looking at me, but you're thinking about the cowboys. I understand. <laughs> this is going to be boring for like this long, and then it's going to get really good, and I'll start yelling and stuff. It's just, just stay with me. It's important, okay? When it comes to the words church, we have to understand how it became a word. And so I want to go back to the verse we just looked at. It's an incredibly important verse. It's the first time Jesus ever talks about the church. And Jesus said, I will build my church. And the power of hell cannot even come against it. I will build my church. And so what I want to do is I want to take our word church and I want to put it in its original language. In the original language, Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. Ecclesia is the word that we translate to church. Ecclesia. Say that with me. Ecclesia. That's pretty good for Texans. That is pretty good. <laughs> Ecclesia is used 115 times in the Bible. Any, anywhere in your Bible that you see the word church, it's the Greek word ecclesia. And if we want to know Jesus' original intent for what he started and gave his life for, that's a great place to start. What does ecclesia actually mean? Ecclesia is a compound word that simply means the called out, the called out. Out. Ek means out, kleo means the called, the called out. In Jesus' time, the ecclesia was actually a political term. It referred to an assembly of people who came together for a significant purpose, to change something, to fix something. Literally, people were called out of society to be a part of this assembly, this ecclesia, for a higher significant purpose. It was how they started political and societal movements in their time. So isn't it interesting that when Jesus gets ready to unleash the whole thing that he came to earth and lived in poverty and died a terrible death for, instead of making up his own word or... Even more interesting, instead of using a religious term, Jesus could have said, I will build my synagogue. 
He could have said, I will build my temple. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus took a word that is in the everyday flow of people's lives, a word that is simply a part of the culture already, and he used it for his own purposes. Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia. I will build my assembly. I will be the one calling people out of their everyday current flow of life to give them a higher and a significant purpose to start a movement in their lives. And not only that, he doubled down by saying, my ecclesia, the one I'm going to build, will be so powerful and so potent that hell itself could not defeat it. Now, this sounds like something that we could get on board with. The original intent right from the beginning, a movement of people, an opportunity to have purpose beyond your everyday flow of life, purpose beyond just going out and making money and paying the bills and going to bed, purpose beyond what we can probably even imagine because not only are we doing this through our own skills and power, but through the power of God himself. A movement is something that you can actually give your life to, that you can be proud that you're a part of. A movement is easy to show up to because you don't want to miss what might happen. You want people to know that you were there. It's a part of your legacy. A movement is easy to invest into, invest your time and your energy and your resources. And if we're honest, that doesn't sound a lot like the church. It's easy to sleep in on church. It's easy to miss a week or two or a month or two. It's easy to forget to give your offering. Besides, we've seen how churches have used and abused the congregants' finances. And so how did this happen? How did we get from this incredible movement that Jesus started, this powerful thing that nothing can overcome, to this declining, dying, 8.5 out of 10 churches getting ready to shut their doors, state of the church? When Jesus left earth, he put his movement the ecclesia in the hands of a group of people called the apostles. And man, the apostles went to work. They organized themselves and they sent each other out on these missions to all the parts of their known world. And they started these local gatherings of the ecclesia, getting people together to put them on mission, to make sure they have clarity about what they're doing, to help them get healthy and challenge them as individuals. These gatherings of people started breaking off into smaller groups and living life together and really pursuing their potential. And the spread of Christianity is unparalleled in the history of the world. It's because they got the ecclesia right. These apostles also fought against things that came against the church. You may know that the first church was under incredible persecution, but there was something even more dark and more sinister that crept up right from within these gatherings. It's called legalism. Anybody ever heard the term legalism? These unwritten rules and regulations that churches can put into place to try and get quality control over their people. Legalism started springing up and they were fighting against it. You can read about it in the New Testament. And legalism actually makes a lot of sense. For one, because as people, we have like this gravitational pull towards control. We like to control things. We're control freaks. But the other side of it is that there's this religious tradition. You see, if you look at every major religion in the world, there are certain tenets that they all follow. And one of the most important is every religion has a sacred place. Every religion has a sacred place, whether it's a mosque or a temple or a synagogue. Everyone has a sacred place, the building, the brick and mortar, the property, the stage, the altar, the pulpit. It's all sacred in and of itself. But then Jesus comes along and he starts a new movement. And he doesn't say, I'm going to build the greatest buildings. He doesn't say, I'm going to create more sacred places. He says, this isn't about the place. This is about the people. Jesus starts a movement that defies all all standard religions. He says this isn't gonna be about a sacred building, it's gonna be about the people who come inside of the building. It's not sacred places, it's sacred people with incredible potential. Now this is a very hard concept for people to get back then, and it's a very hard concept for people to fully live in today. It's why we have to be serious and radical about getting back to the original intent for this movement that Jesus started. In some of the early gatherings of this ecclesia, people decided they needed a sacred place. They needed to be a little bit more like the other religions. And so they started these things that they called Kyriakon. Kyrios is the Greek word for Lord. Kyriakon literally means the Lord's house. 
They needed a sacred place. They wanted to be a little bit more like everything else. They wanted to put a little bit more control on it. And it may seem like just a one degree difference from what Jesus started, and maybe it was. Maybe they were just fitting in with the culture. Maybe they were just fitting in with the context around them, trying to make sense. The problem with one degree of separation is that over time, the gap widens and widens until someday, what you have is unrecognizable from the original intent. They needed a sacred place. And so they started a Curiacon. Here's where it gets kind of crazy. When it came time to translate from Greek to early German, an early German dialect, the translators got together and they started doing this incredible job of getting the Bible into people's hands where they can read it. But it, when it came time to translate the word ecclesia, the movement, they allowed themselves to be influenced by the culture and influenced by the tradition and influenced by the sacred place. And so they landed on a word that is in German. If anyone speaks German in here, I'm sorry. I'm from Lampasas. I'm going to get this wrong. It's going to be terrible. A word similar to Kirche, which also means the house of the Lord. And the gap continued to widen. Eventually, it was time to translate into English, and the English translator sat down, and in the tradition of the Curiacon and the Kirche, they decided on the word church, which bore a similar meaning, focusing on the place, not on the people. It's interesting, when the Bible was first translated into English, there was a man named Tyndale. There's still Tyndale tran translations of the Bible. And he looked at the original Greek, and he saw the word ecclesia, and he said, man, we've gotten off somewhere. The word ecclesia is just about people. It's about a movement and a gathering of people who really want to make a difference in the world. And somewhere along the way, we've made it about the buildings and the organizations and the, the structures and the properties. And so he refused to translate the word church. He said, when I see ecclesia, I will put the word congregation, which is a beautiful thing because it puts the emphasis back on the people and off of the place. But Tyndale's quest to be back in the original intent of what Jesus desired for us ended up getting him burned at the freaking stake. And so here's where this gets serious. Because when you start jacking with people's traditions, and when you start questioning things like the word church, when you get radical about really following Jesus and what his intention was for you, it will ruffle some feathers. Some people will not like you messing with tradition. And so we have to decide if we are going to be a people who pursues what Jesus desires for us with reckless abandon, we have to decide if we're willing to figure out what Jesus started and to get in the flow of it no matter what comes. And I'm telling you right now that myself and on behalf of the staff here, we're ready. If we have to go up in flames to try and figure out what the original intent of, of the scripture is, we will do it because it's worth it and the world needs a movement that even the power of hell cannot come against. So that's the brief history of how we got from the ecclesia to the church, and when I, when I realized this, a lot of things fell into place. We, we called it the wrong thing, and we gave it the wrong meaning, and so of course, of course people took the money that congregants brought in and built elaborate structures and had to make sure that their stained glass was a little bit nicer than the stained glass down the street. Of course we built churches that looked like castles instead of using that money and leveraging it to actually help people who need it out in the community. Of course entire churches have split trying to choose the color of carpet. They're outfitting the house of God. That seems like arguing over. Unless the church is just a building and God lives inside of us. You see, things begin to change when you put things in their proper perspective. By putting the emphasis on the building, it's like we tried to put God in a box. We tried to stifle his movement. And I'm telling you, it is time to unleash him. The ecclesia isn't something that you go to. It's not something you build. It's not an organization that the IRS can put their finger on. It's a group of people who have been called out, called out of their depression, called out of their ignorance, called out of their bad situation and their addictions, called out despite their lack of qualifications, called out not to come somewhere and try to out-memorize verses or out-sing the row in front of you, but called out to be on mission to move out in our world where people are desperate and are dying without the hope of Jesus. That's what Jesus gave his life for. And you and I have been called out to pursue it. Yeah. 
And so why would anyone go to church? Why would anyone go to church? If you ask me, maybe they shouldn't. In fact, I've challenged our staff here to try our hardest, except when it's just a must because it's, you know, an understanding barrier, to take the word church out of our vocabulary. It's why we're calling it City West. We haven't changed the name. We're still City Church West. We're still very proud to be a part of City Church at large, three locations on mission across our city. But let's be honest. We're putting it all on the table today. And if we're honest, the word church has become one of the most incredible grace barriers. And there are people that you probably know in your life who need to be here, connecting with God, finding their purpose, and they won't come because of the word church. And so know that you have permission not to use it. Invite them to City West, this gathering of people who are coming together, getting inspired and finding our potential. Invite them to this community of faith. You know what, if you want to get real honest, invite them to this group of jacked up people who don't have all the answers but love each other and are going to figure it out. And so quickly, let me, let me tell you what I'm not saying. I'm not saying that this doesn't have a purpose. This has an incredible purpose. I'm not saying that you should just get a blanket and go out in nature and sit down all by yourself like, hmm, church, this is it's a good day at church. Um, but in the offering plate, there we go. There is reason and there is purpose for meeting together. In the book of Hebrews, the writer says, let us be concerned about one another in order to promote love, to promote good works, not staying away from our worship meetings as some people do, not neglecting meeting here together, but encouraging each other, encouraging each other more and more as the day draws near, the day of Jesus returning to come and get us. Meeting together is vitally important to really fulfill your role and to meet your potential as a part of this movement. To meet together is to say I can do more together than I can just by myself, saying I want to double down and triple down and exponentially have impact out in my world. So at City West, we're not meeting together to build up our status or to someday build the coolest, most high-tech building in the entire world or to spend money on frivolous things. We meet together so that we can move together. It is so simple. We meet together and move together. We meet together and what? and we move together. And so I wanna show you how we at City West are going to uniquely play our role as part of the bigger ecclesia, the movement of God that is redeeming people's lives and writing the story of history. I wanna show you how we are going to practically do that here. The point of today's talk is to let you peek behind the curtain and then to rip the curtain down and light it on fire. No more curtains. I want you to know how we are actually gonna go forward. And so a couple of months ago, we went on a retreat as a staff and we got clear. We created a really simple icon. We have one mission to go out and to be a movement, like affecting people with the hope of Jesus. And we have a simple icon to show you the areas we're gonna do that in. And so we said that the amazing thing about the Ecclesia is that it's not about a place, it's about people. And so the starting place for us at City West is people. So our first circle is just that, it's you. It's the individuals, meeting people on an individual level. And as individuals, we're not looking for perfect people. In fact, no perfect people allowed. What we're looking for is for people to pursue health. And I'm not talking about we're gonna be doing push-ups even though I know Noel had y'all jumping around a little bit earlier. I'm talking about four areas of health that I think are vitally important. Relational health, spiritual health, emotional health, and financial health. And the reason we are gonna focus on those four areas of health on an individual level is because if any of those areas are off, if you're unhealthy in your finances, in your relationships, emotionally or spiritually, it will sabotage your significance moving forward. It will keep you from fully engaging and meeting your potential as a part of the movement. If those areas are unhealthy, they are such incredible distractions. And so we are putting together relatively short and simple but powerful programs that when the season of life comes and you need it, you can go through it and work on yourself as an individual because the ecclesia is made of individuals meeting together and moving together. The second circle I'm gonna draw a little bit different. The second circle is the community circle. 
And I've drawn this with dashed lines because today we're getting honest. And to be honest with you, we have not been intentional about creating this. And so we have some people who are meeting in smaller circles outside of our weekend gatherings organically, and that's beautiful. But what I'm telling you today is over the next 10 months, we are going to put time and energy and resources. We're even looking at someone as a potential hire to come and spend all their time and focus on this second circle of getting teams of people together so that you can apply the things that you're learning so you can hold each other accountable in these smaller circles. You can create alliances, these deep providential relationships with each other, and you can become authentic, the real version of yourself. That's who God wants. God's not looking for all the masks that you wear in all your different settings so you can make it through your day. He's looking for who you really are because that's where you're going to find your unique and impactful purpose. The last circle is our weekend services, our gatherings. Gathering all of these individuals together who here in the next year will also be gathering themselves in teams throughout the week to get inspired and enlightened. Uh, some people call the weekend service like the, the, the fuel pump. Like you just kind of coast in after a hard week and you get filled back up so you can go out and live it and you can get in these smaller circles of people and you can really apply and you can push each other and challenge each other to really be living out this movement and affecting change and then at an individual level, taking time out to go through a program, to get yourself right, to get on these tracks where there aren't distractions in your way, where you can come together with people and really make a difference. You know, it's incredible how we can get one word wrong. We get one degree off and, and we end up so far away. But you know what? I believe that God's given us a new word and it's the word movement. And I believe that he's gonna unleash something in your lives as individuals, in smaller circles here, and as a movement of City West that is going to do exponentially more than we can even imagine. It's gonna be simple. We're gonna meet together and we're gonna move together. We're gonna meet in these services, these gatherings that we have every weekend to get inspired and enlightened. We're gonna meet in smaller circles to push each other and pursue our potential. We're gonna meet in some of these programs as individuals to get ourselves healthy and really be able to engage in the movement. And if we will meet together and we will move together, we will begin to change the world. Let me pray for us. God, we love you. Man, I thank you that you didn't come and just start another everyday religion with sacred places and, and unwritten rules, God. You didn't come down and start another religion where it's about our works or our skills or abilities. God, you came down and you started a movement. You came down and started something that we can all play a vital role in. Regardless of our lack of qualification, regardless of our history or the things that we're ashamed of in our past, God, you came down for us. You came down for the elite and for the misfits. God, I pray that you continue to reveal to us our purpose, our calling, that we would come together, meet together and move together and watch as you just impact our world. We love you and we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Man, as we're moving together, I'm very excited that on November 12th, we're gonna be doing baptisms. And so if you've taken that step to believe in Jesus for the first time, you, you wanna demonstrate that by getting baptized in a horse trough in a bar, we would love to be a part of that with you. You can go to the mini bar and get signed up. Listen, I wanna thank you guys who are contributing here financially. If you're not, I would encourage you to do so. This is not church as usual. This is a movement. You need to be investing in it because God is going to do something incredible through this place. We're gonna keep moving next week. I love you guys. I hope to see you there.